Welcome everyone to the new fly fisher. In today's show, we join expert fly fisher Jeff Blood to fish on some of the extraordinary steelhead streams of Pennsylvania. This state has some of the best Lake Erie steelhead fishing to be had in the fall. Stay with us, it's going to be a great program. Pennsylvania is a unique state because of its progressive fishery management. Every year they stock the streams that run into Lake Erie with huge numbers of fry, and thankfully there is a high return rate as mortality levels in the lake are relatively low. Some of the major tributaries into Lake Erie include 12 mile, 16 mile, and 20 mile creeks east of the city of Erie, and Elk, Walnut, and Crooked Creeks which are west of Erie. There are numerous other tributaries of smaller size which have less fishable water, but nonetheless can also be good. All of these waters drain south to north in Erie County over ancient shale beds, which also contain large amounts of greenish clay. Over the millenniums, the runoff has eroded and carved the shale, creating ledges, chutes, and sharp drop-offs into the stream beds. This is what makes Lake Erie County tributaries so unique and challenging to fly fish for steelhead. These lake run fish will often use the maze of stream bed topography to their advantage for resting and holding areas. Jeff Blood is an accomplished fly fisher who I have greatly admired for some time. An energetic and gregarious individual, Jeff is really a wonderful person to spend a day on the river with. He is constantly observing and assessing what is going on around him. That is why he is one of the best nymph fishers I know. Jeff is always adjusting and adapting to the fishing conditions and the related river structure, which is why he's so consistently successful. It should be noted that Jeff is also very much the inventor and had a great deal to do with the development and marketing of frog hair tippet material. When Jeff offered me the opportunity to join him for a couple days of steelheading, I jumped at the opportunity as I knew we'd learn a lot. Try and throw it out, out into the current a little bit more, throw so just a tiny men in that. Okay. Up. up in there, throw a downstream end. Downstream end. There you go. There you go. That'll front it down now. Yeah, there you go. Well, the reason is, whoop, there, right there. Ooh. That fish? Yeah, throw that downstream end and keep the rod tip down. Here, yeah. If you're going to throw a mend, you want the rod tip down. To the, whoop. When you see me high sticking, it's because I'm not actually. Uh, Using the indicator on on bouncing the bottom. Okay. So right now. Yeah. Oops. Nothing. Take that. And then follow that a little more. There's a drift right there. See that? And get ready. Just slight little right there. There's a fish. That's a big one too. Get them off your finger now. Get them on your reel. There you go. Good. You got it now. Um, I think so. it's, it's a, it, it, there's a little bit of difference, but that's that's all that you need to do. Your drag is a uh, little tight. If he wants that's to really, yeah. yeah, but if he wants to make a big run on you, he's going to pop you. See, what I like to do is to crank my drag down light enough where if that fish starts to move on its own, it comes. And then I'll put extra tension on the line. Sometimes okay. using my finger, when I slow down, you don't want to burn your finger. Okay, this fish is about to come out of the water. He's not quite as big as I thought. He took the egg fly, I think. Nice little male. Okay, put him back nice and gently, gently, and there we go. 
Okay, I, I have two different styles uh, that I basically fix. One is um, straight lining it, where I'm, I'm tapping the bottom with weight and feeling it more than I am watching it float. And then I also do a tr traditional float method where you're using your indicator and letting the indicator float down and trying to make it as natural as you possibly can. And there's kind of a combination between the two of those that you sometimes do part of the way through a drift. And there's going to be, there's a nice fish here. Oh, nice jump. Now I try to keep my rod up in the air straight up like this and keep as much line off the water as I possibly can. When, you, when your line's on the water, you create drag. When you create drag, you create tension on the line. And that's often what breaks it. And you'll notice a lot of times on fish that you break off and they make a long, long run away. You can't help but have your line on the water. And that's when you break them off. So if you notice, my rod is actually almost pointing straight up in the air. We've got a double on here. Well, this should be fun and interesting. And uh, we'll see how good both of us are here skill-wise in landing these two fish side by side. I think we can do it. He's a pretty good fisherman up there. And the trick is, is to get the head up. And I'll just bring him in. Then I turn my rod sideways to the bank after I get it. And get their head pointed upstream and over to the bank a little bit. And just, when they're ready, run them. It's a decent fish. It's not a big one. And run them over here. And get it right up there. And the white hockey is a small one, actually. But a nice one. And, uh, great. Nice little fish. This guy will get his one out here. We haven't caught a real big one yet, but they're here. I had one plus. Learning to properly set up your rig for nymphing to steelhead is a bit of an art in itself. Throughout the Great Lakes, accomplished fly fishers have adapted their line, leader, and fly setups to effectively probe the water column for steelhead. Jeff has a simple yet effective Whoa. system for rigging his rod, which has proven to be particularly deadly. Basically, the rig that I use for fishing Great Lake steelhead on small to medium streams is a nine and a half foot leader. And normally what I do when I test my leader, I'm six feet tall, is I will stretch it there's six, and my first fly is about another three. Uh, from there, I tie in Pennsylvania and Ohio, where you're allowed to fish a two-fly rig, I tie another fly directly on to the bend of the hook, and about three feet back, I'll put uh, a different fly. I like to fish a white zonker, which imitates the lake minnow in some type of an egg imitation. To that, I have my split shot about uh, anywhere between 14 and 18 inches, and I uh, will adjust that according to the flow of the water and the depth of the water. And then I like to use an indicator. Um, I use two methods of fishing. I straight line it, and I float uh, an indicator. And uh, what I do on the indicator is to double my line over and uh, push it through the, uh, the hole that's in this indicator, feed it back through. And that allows me to adjust the indicator uh, according to the depth of the water. And in most cases, I'm all the way up to the top so that I have nine and a half feet of, of line. But as I get into uh, maybe slower water without the same amount of of depth and I want to have the indication occur quicker uh, because they're more subtle, I can move that down my line very quickly. Then from there, I f like to fish an eight weight line simply because I am uh, fishing a lot of weight sometimes in real heavy water. And I use a 10 and a half foot rod with any kind of a good uh, steelhead reel. Uh, that has a good, uh, I like an adjustable drag, which is right here, so that I can adjust it while I'm fighting a fish. The longer rods uh, just give you more of a casting uh, ability to control and mend your line, or to lift your line up off the water 
so that you can reduce drag if there's a faster current here in front of you. And it's all about line control. Um, also, I think there's some advantages with a longer rod in fighting the fish. I, I try when I'm fighting the fish to make sure that I keep as much line off the water as I possibly can as I'm, as I'm fishing, when, I, when I'm fighting the fish. And the reason for that is just to re reduce the stress um, that's applied to your line. A lot of breaks come from the fact, break offs uh, on fish from the fact that you have a lot of line down on or in the water, and I'm talking about the fly line itself, and that just puts stress on your line and uh, can cause you to not be able to uh, uh, fight the fish and you'll lose them. I changed my streamer because I just lost my last my little zonker pattern. Oh, nice. A nice mail. <laughs> Feel the power of this fish. I'll stick them for Atlantic salmon. Same for steelhead. A minute per pound. Just so you can get these fish in quickly. And the revive. There he goes again. It's a nice male. Okay. Oh, it's a nice male. Okay. Oh. This, ladies and gentlemen, how's that, Jeff? Look at that. That is why I like steelhead. Let's just quickly get this out. We're just in the top. Okay. Off he goes. <laughs> this is exciting. This is really exciting. Now, should I take more? Yeah, let's back? just walk them right over here. The fall steelheading can be quite spectacular. And when the run is on and you're properly presenting the fly, it can be incredible. In fact, we were catching so many fish that our cameraman, Barry Acton, had to give it a try himself. It wasn't long before Jeff had him into his first fish. Yep, you can. Okay, we got him here. Not bad, not bad at all. Not bad for a cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Colin, if you notice what I'm doing here is I'm stepping forward into the stream, and the reason I'm doing that comes back to that grid uh, approach to the stream where you quadrant it off, and now we're trying to just reach across the current and fish the other side of the pool with a nice natural drip. And, uh, the way this pool is right now, and, and the, the way the water's flowing, the fish are probably going to be lying, if they're up here this high, over along that seam that's mm -hmm. on the other side of the bank. Yeah, there'll be some nice yeah. current breaks in there. Yes, and, and that seam right there where I'm into now is if there's fish in here, probably where they're going to be lying, maybe just a little closer. Okay. If you stand back and you make the cast from 10 feet back, what you do is you diminish your ability to throw a natural drift a really good caster can, a uh, good fisherman, but um, what you're now contending with more water, more distance, there's drag in this water down here in front of you as you're fishing. If your line's down in the water like that, you just create instant drag, which is then uh, makes your presentation a lot more, a uh, lot less natural than uh, it needs to be to get the fish to take it. I think it's interesting what you're saying about uh the approach you take to basically unknown waters, you don't know where the lies are, 
right. You have to be very methodical. Uh, that's very much like Atlantic salmon fishing, where you come to a pool you don't know, and you're trying to find where the fish are lying, and it, you it's much systematically like, go through it. It's it's fishing everywhere, uh, whether it's Atlantic salmon or uh, largemouth bass or or uh, steelhead or regular rainbow or brown trout. The uh, the approach has to be if you don't know the water, you need to learn it. You don't know what kind of hazards are out there as far as snags, so you try you know to save as much tackle as you possibly can and learn to pull. Plus, you know, there are ledges on the bottom of these streams. Um, if you've never fished it before, uh, you need to learn where those ledges are because that's where the fish have a tendency to hold. They feel safer. There's normally uh, some type of uh, a slower um, impact of the water right there as it's, as it's coming down and, and doesn't tire the fish as much. So I have fished this pool pretty good, and we haven't um, hooked anything up. And as you know, there are a lot of fish in the water. So normally, if I make uh, 10 or 15 casts and I don't detect a fish in there, I move on to the next pool, which is what I think we ought to do, Colin. OK. There we go. All righty. There he goes. Head up here. That fish was lying exactly where you'd expect him to be. He's right in the edge of the current there, on the inside, this side, eh? Not the. Yeah, uh, they're they're uh, fairly predictable in what they're doing. doesn't want to quit. He's not that big a fish. He's just got a lot of strength. Is this fish uh, kicking your... No, he's not kicking my hiney. I just thought maybe he was. <laughs> that was another fish up river to kick oh, my hiney. Oh, oh, Ted's already got one on, eh? Oh, yeah. Okay. Say, come on, you gotta come in here. Yeah, yeah, what's up, man? Caught him on the blood dot. Okay. Well, he's all wrapped up, too. There we go. Okay. There we go. Just Good quickly. Job. One, there's the other. Is that three, four pounder? Okay, there we go. As Jeff has detailed, it's important for fishers to understand how to approach any stretch of water and methodically search it with their fly. An intelligent and progressive approach is needed in order to systematically work every part of a run or pool. As this animation clearly shows, it is important to probe every area as a steelhead can often be in locations you don't expect. By taking this systematic approach, you'll greatly improve your odds of presenting your fly to an active fish, no matter what type of fishing you're doing. No idea if his mic's working. What have you been catching them on? Holy buggers? Steelhead are an incredibly dynamic fish, capable of long drag streaming runs and multiple cartwheel type jumps. These fish are like silver sticks of dynamite waiting to go off, and they will use every trick to break you off. In fact, we often lost many of the fish we successfully hooked. Oh. Well, you know, I pull on them too hard. We have a big run of fish right here in front of us. And so what I'm doing is uh, it's kind of fast water. There's a little pocket down there. Those fish are in that pocket. 
I'm doing a straight line technique where I can feel my flush shot bouncing along the bottom when it stops is when I strike and normally catch the fish right here. Uh, what I'm not doing right now is fishing all the water because there's one condensed spot that they all seem to be congregated in. I'm pretty much focusing and concentrating my efforts there. When you're nymph fishing, basically what I'm looking for is two things. Um, the visual is, is for my leader or my indicator to do something that doesn't appear to be natural. Stop or hesitate or move in a, in a direction upstream or left or right. Or if I'm uh, also bouncing the bottom, I'm actually feeling my line and I'm feeling the hesitation of the, the, uh, the leader. And if I feel that hesitation or I see the uh, line do something it shouldn't, I strike. And a big mistake that a lot of fishermen make is that they don't strike often enough and they feel, well, that's the bottom and, and uh, when in reality it was probably a fish. This is fun. Oh. Jeff is the inventor of the blood dot fly, which has become a favorite on the tributaries of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. It is both simplistic and deadly because it provides both the right color, silhouette, and translucent needed to attract steelhead and large trout. To learn more about this fly or our series, please visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. Steelheading in Pennsylvania's Great Lakes tributaries is truly an incredible adventure. The sheer number of fish, combined with their fighting abilities, rivals the expectations anglers would have if they fished in Labrador or Alaska. If you get the opportunity, I strongly recommend you come to this region to fly fish in the fall. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. To order a copy of your favorite new fly fisher episode, contact us through our website at www.thenewflyfisher.com or call us at 613-836-8295. Copies of this educational series make an excellent gift for your favorite angler or friend, and they also make a good addition to your reference library. $14.95 for one VHS tape, plus shipping and handling. Order three tapes and only pay $39.95, plus shipping and handling.